In this video, we're looking at Chord Sequencer, the new player from Reason Studios. I think they've done a really great job with this one. It comes after the other players Reason has released recently, Baseline Generator, Pattern Mutator, We've got a whole bunch of really, really cool players inside Reason now. And this one I think is probably the most useful for musicians who don't have quite as strong a background in music theory or harmony. We build chords by taking notes out of a scale and arranging them in a certain way. But if we're not quite sure how to go about that, then we're relying solely on our ears. Which is not a bad thing, but if you have a bit of theoretical understanding as to what notes you should put where to get what sound, it can speed up the whole process. Chord Sequencer solves that problem by giving us a predetermined set of chords that are all gonna sound great together. If you do wanna learn a little bit more about how chords are constructed, I will link an article from my website in the description. This article goes over how we get chords and has pretty much an exhaustive list of chord formulas. So, handy little reference tool for you. Now, one aspect of harmony is understanding chord function. This means understanding the role of any particular chord in a progression and knowing where it wants to go, or where it could go. There, there are obviously no rules when it comes to this stuff. I think Chord Sequencer does a really, really cool way of giving you a sense of chord function. If you've ever done any songwriting before, you might have seen these kind of diagrams floating around the internet. They give you an idea of chord function. They show you which chords fit in certain sequences within chord progressions, but it does look really confusing and you have to apply a whole bunch of thought yourself. Chord Sequencer, on the other hand, gives us this sense of chord function without that. We have our set of chords here and they're all color coded with different shades of green. And these obviously change for every chord. One chord might sound great after another chord, but it might sound less ideal after a different chord. I really like how they put it in the documentation. Bright green means a typical progression, while darker shades mean less obvious choices. I think the interface for this player is very intuitive. In the middle here, we have our chords we can use. It shows how they're displayed on the keyboard. And then down here, it shows a progression we've programmed in this little sequencer. So if we hit run, We can clear this, we can drag any chord in based on the grid we select. And we can extend the number of bars. It shows us what we've got here. Up here, we've got our chord sets. These are grouped by genre and there's a whole lot of different choices. You can see if we change one, it's also gonna change what ended up being down here in the sequence. So this isn't locked. This reflects what you've got up here in your chord set. Over here on this side, we've got how we interact with the velocity. We've got an option to humanize the velocity and the timing, which is just gonna input an element of randomness to the progression as it plays it back. We can change the octave of it. Remove the bass automatically or set it to remove below a certain key. We can also add a root note to the top or the bottom. And when we do this, it's not reflected on the little keyboard here. One other useful trick you can use this for is to hit edit mode. And if you're unsure what chord you might be playing, you can just hit the notes and it's gonna tell you, it's a C chord. C sus two, C sus four, C major seven. The chord library in this is pretty good. I was really impressed by how accurately it was describing the chords that I was playing in. But it's not perfect. Wait a second. That is not an A11 chord. This is a really cool tool but I would take it with a grain of salt. Now, 
there are a whole bunch of really sick combinator patches. If you haven't already, I would I would suggest having a look at these. They're pretty cool. Now, one thing to note: if you are playing your keys on the keyboard, that's that's going to control the chords in your set, unless you turn off this MIDI button. Then you can play them all just anywhere. But I'm going to clear this and create a little bit of a loop. I want to I want to lay down a structure for a song. What I'm going to do now is copy chords and sequence to pattern two because what I want to do is add this G here, I think. Okay. Um, I don't know if there is a way to individually change the velocity of this one that I've dragged in because it has been recording the velocity that I've been playing on the machine. So that's annoying. One other thing I'm noticing that I don't like is I don't think there's a way for me to just play back this section of the sequence. That could be particularly annoying if you want to hear what a change you've made might sound like when it's in this fourth one down here. If you've got like a whole 16 bar loop, you'll have to listen through the whole thing before hearing your adjustment. It would be nice if there was kind of an option to select where playback started from when you hit run. Um, let's, let's record that again with the G. I do really, really love interacting with this chord set in this 16 bar or 16, 16 thing, the grid, like a beat pad. It makes it so much easier because when it's laid out on the keyboard, well, you can do it on the keyboard and it works great, but you kind of have to know which key relates to which chord. Whereas if you're using a pad, you can just do it. It's great. I love it. One thing that I don't love about this progression that I just made is if you listen to the bass note in this chord here, we've got like a really low bass note. So let's play it back. That bass note doesn't exist in the other chords, in that register. What I'm actually going to do is click edit and remove it. And let's see what that sounds like. I think that's probably better. So I'll make the edit here in this pattern as well. Now what I have is my variation where I just end with an F chord. Then on my second pattern, I end with the five chord here, the G11. So I'm thinking about this as being my verse progression. I kind of want to get a pre-chorus going on. So what I'm going to do is copy chords to pattern three that's going to pop the chord set over here without taking the sequence. So now I can come up with like a pre-chorus progression. So this is where a little bit of chord theory 
comes in handy because even though it tells me what chords might sound nice before or after the others, I still understand what the functions are. And so I have an idea of which chords I might want to play in order to get a pre-chorus sounding vibe. So let's try and record something. All right, that's just gonna be a four bar loop. So using two Fs here, they've got slightly different voices. That's a really useful thing to do because it gives you that same feeling of rhythmic movement that we had here. Again, copy chords over to pin four. Let's maybe come up with a chorus. Wait a second. That is not an A11 chord. Ooh. What happens if I add a C sharp? No, no, no. Okay, this is to change the root note of the chord to A. A, C sharp, A7, A9. Nope, nope, that is an A11. Okay. Apparently, apparently A dominant 11 is not a thing. We've got A7, A9. That, that right there should be A11, A13. What we originally had, which was this, That's not an A11. You can't have a dominant seventh chord without the third scale degree and the seventh scale degree. Okay, this is interesting. This is this is problematic because this was straight up tripping me out. When I looked at this, I was kind of avoiding using this A11 because in my mind, I'm like, I know that's got a C sharp in it and I don't want that note in these progressions. Then I play it and I'm like, hang on, not feeling a C sharp. That is incorrect from a theory point of view. That's not an A11 chord. Because it's, it's, it's ambiguous. If we just hit this MIDI thing and play the chord, this would be an A11 chord. We'd have to have this, which you can hear is a totally different sound. If we have an A minor 11, A11. So you can hear that that third scale degree, whether it's flattened for the minor or natural for the major, that really, really changes the whole vibe of the chord. And what we have instead, it's it's neither neither major or minor. Again, here's minor, here's major. I really would like to understand how this player is figuring out what chords it's playing. And I'd also like to know how it is weighting the chords in the sense of whether they're light green, dark green, or darker green. Is that something that people chose when they program these chord sets or is the player doing it by itself? Because while I generally think it works pretty well, telling you what chord you're playing, this is not an A11 chord. That's that's like a fairly significant departure from how chord construction works. Um, anyway, chorus, I've lost my train of thought. Wait, what? G, G, F, A, C. 
That's it's not a G11 either. That's the same shape. I think this would be better described as a G9 sus4 chord. Same with this A11. But if we go over here and type G9 sus4 chord into Google, ninth chord with the third replaced by a fourth. Most of the time the fifth is left out. We don't have a fifth, fifth would be D. So here's a ninth chord. Fifth is left out, so that means no D. And the third becomes a fourth. And all that's happening is we're playing that fourth up an octave. And then they're adding a bass. See, what would be nice is if you could force the name of the chord because if I was creating a chord set that I wanted to use at a later date, if I was like saving something or whatever, I'd want to look at this and recognize that it's a 9 sus 4 chord, not an 11. That's just confusing. So I have a couple of verse variations and I have a chorus variation and a pre-chorus variation. This is this is where another mildly frustrating aspect of the Reason Rack plugin comes in. As it stands, there is no way for me to get the MIDI from this player, which is playing my instrument. There's no way for me to get the MIDI from this player to this track. What I'm gonna to have to do is duplicate this track, get rid of the player here. So now this instance of the Reason plugin is only holding my instrument. Then I'm gonna to have to go back to this one. I'm gonna to have to replace my instrument with, wrong browser. I'm going to have to replace my instrument with a MIDI out device. Now I'm going to have to select the Reason Rack plugin, Reason Rack plugin, hit record. Now if I record. So I still don't love that you have to go through all of that. Like, please, can we have a MIDI click and drag? Cause that would be useful. So you check this out. I want to add some drums. I'm going to find a groove. Okay. Let's say I want to use that groove, right? Here's what I do. I grab it and I drag it into the track. I don't have to create a second instance. I don't have to record the MIDI in so much nicer. His chord sequencer. I'm gonna finish laying down some parts for this beat. There's a lot to love about this player. I actually think it might be my favorite one so far, but it's not perfect. 
mainly in regards to how it deals with aspects of pool construction and harmony. Now, this is not at all a dig because that's, that's hard to do, that's hard to program. And I don't think there will ever be a kind of player that absolutely nails and gets chord harmony perfect from a contextual point of view. So it's a minor issue for me. It just makes it a little bit frustrating to use when you look at something and you're thinking about how it actually works from a music point of view and then it's different. That was a little bit annoying. Overall, I really, really like this player. I think it has been executed in an incredibly easy to use intuitive way. And I think that I think it'll be a really awesome tool for a lot of musicians. All right, that's the video. This is my, my first kind of time messing around properly with Chord Sequencer. Let me know what you think of it in the comments. Don't forget to subscribe to the channel, give this video a like, and I'll catch you next time.